Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this webinar um, about the recovery trial one year on. Uh, my name is Richard Haynes. I'm one of the team working in Oxford that has been uh, working on the trial since March last year, and I'm delighted uh, that we've been joined by um, a great group of speakers this morning who are going to be able to give us um, a really interesting background to the trial and some real insight into what it's been like um, over the past year. We've got some of the scientists involved in the design and delivery of the trial um, from Oxford. We've got doctors from working at some of the sites, uh, both in the UK and abroad. And most importantly, we've got a participant, um, somebody who actually took part in the trial, who's going to be able to share um, her thoughts and experiences um, on the whole matter. It's been quite a year, I think we'll all agree. And we're going to talk about some fairly big numbers um, over the next hour, but I think it's important that we remember that each one of those um, numbers that we talk about is an individual person with their own story and their own ex and their own experiences. Um, and some of them, and for some people uh, watching or, or listening to this, um, maybe it didn't always end as well as we would have liked. And we do recognise that. And in fact, that's the very reason we do trials like recovery, uh, to try and improve uh, the experience for people, and by doing that, we can therefore improve public health. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Peter Horby, who's the Professor of Emerging Infectious Diseases uh, here at Oxford University, and one of the chief investigators of the recovery trial. So I'll hand over to Peter um, to kick us off. Great, thank you very much, Richard, and thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, I realise we may have uh, participants from across the world, so you know, good morning, but also good afternoon and good evening. Uh, for all of those listening. I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the background of trying to do clinical trials in epidemics and where we've come over the past decade or so. Um, next slide, please. Now, we have frequent epidemics, um, and the one before this one really was the 2009 swine flu epidemic, and we see very similar messages. So here we saw a call for global action as outbreak spreads you'll see here some of the, the, the rather alarmist headlines in some of the U, UK newspapers around the swine flu outbreak in 2009. So if we look at what we achieved in terms of clinical trials in 2009, next slide please, we can see that the response wasn't what we would have liked. This graph shows um, the number of patients that were anticipated to be enrolled in clinical trials of new treatments for influenza. So the, the, the bar on the left shows that there were almost 6,000 patients that people had the ambition to enrol in clinical trials. And the next bar shows you the actual number of patients enrolled. So far, far fewer, only about one and a half thousand patients. And then the next bar, the third one, the actual patients enrolled where the results were published is tiny, it's negligible. And so what we see is that despite a global pandemic of influenza, which we knew was coming, it's the one outbreak that we were all expecting, we really did not manage to run any good clinical trials of new treatments for influenza. And the upshot of that is that, that, that 10 years afterwards, we really don't have any good new treatments for influenza. We did not advance care of patients at all. Next slide, please. So those of you who are now familiar with epidemic curves, which we all are over, over this year, um, this is what an epidemic curve looks like, but really we had an epidemic curve of ambition in 2009. We had a huge number of ideas, but it did not translate well into protocols, into patients, and it really translated into zero new evidence. Next slide, please. So what we've been trying to do over the last decade really is shift that epidemic curve of ambition so that we're perhaps a bit less ambitious about the number of ideas, but we're much more aggressive in making sure that those ideas do translate into protocols, into patients enrolled in trials and to improving care, whether that's proving th things do work or proving things don't work, uh, all of those contribute to improving care. Next slide, please. So how did we got on? So this is the e Ebola West Africa outbreak of 2014, um, which you will all have, have heard about. This was a, was a, a regional crisis, a, a huge um, terrible event actually in West Africa, where we attempted to fast track clinical trials and improve on 2019. And this shows you the epidemic curve of the number of Ebola cases in two of the West African countries, with the arrows showing various events. Um, the first arrow shows when our first grant was awarded and several trials were opened with the acronyms you can see there, but the BCV trial was one of the trials that we ran. And it was three, three and a half months from the grant being awarded 
to the trial being open, which was pretty good improvement um, compared to the usual timeframes of clinical trials, which can be a year or more before you enroll the first patient. That trial then stopped for various reasons. And then we opened a second trial, which is the TKM trial, you can see as the last arrow. And it was just 39 days from when we closed the BCV trial to opening the TKM trial. So already we'd learned a lot and we had really um, telescoped the time frame from years to months to just 39 days. But as you can see, it was still quite late in the epidemic. So we really didn't, uh, in that West Africa outbreak, come out with any definitive answers about treatments that work in Ebola. Next slide, please. So here we've got another uh, outbreak. This time it is the COVID outbreak. The whole world must take action now, similar headlines. Um, question is, did we improve in our ability to do clinical research? Certainly the quality of the tabloid headlines hasn't improved much, but how has our clinical trials uh, expertise improved? Next slide, please. So obviously the outbreak started in Wuhan in China um, and we have ongoing collaborations with partners in China and the outbreak was first announced on December 30th, 2019. And we had our first call on the 2nd of January with our collaborators in China, uh, the little box on the left there. And we managed to get a trial up and running uh, in just 20 days. So we improved from 39 days. So the first patient was enrolled in a randomized controlled trial in Wuhan in China, just 20 days after the outbreak was announced. That was a real, uh, a real improvement. Next slide, please. However, outbreaks are unpredictable. Um, and so you can't always guarantee success, even if you're quick. So this shows you that what happened to the epidemic curve in Wuhan because of the very aggressive control measures in China, the outbreak um, was controlled relatively quickly in Wuhan. So although we opened the trial very early on, we still didn't get enough patients to really get a definitive answer uh, in this particular part of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So at this time, the, trial, the, the, the outbreak had moved to, to Europe uh, and it was clear that we, we had to shift our focus very quickly from China to Europe where the epidemic had shifted and we, so we had to move with it. And the, the context of the recovery trial was that experience I've just talked about and our understanding that there would be a huge clinical challenge. We saw what happened in Wuhan uh, we saw what was happening in Italy. We knew that we would have overstretched health services, huge time pressures, and a lot of patients that would be quite unwell, um, many of them elderly. Um, and we also knew there would be huge therapeutic uncertainty. Early on in epidemics, there's a lot of candidate drugs suggested, but very few of them have any good evidence supporting their use. Next slide, please. And, you know, big political pressure to test certain things. You'll all have, you know, uh, been following the hydroxychloroquine story where there was huge um, um, faith that it worked but no evidence um, and a lot of political pressure to use it uh, and the only way really to find out whether this is a good drug to use is to do a proper clinical trial and find out. Next slide please. So the principle to the recovery trial Martin we'll talk a bit more about this later uh, it had to be quick uh, very quick it had to be big because it was unlikely we would have any single magical drug um, and it had to be simple because the, the health service and the, the health practitioners, the nurses, the doctors, the pharmacists would be under enormous pressure so it had to be simple. Next slide please. So this now shows the epidemic curve, the early stages of the epidemic curve in the UK. On 10th of March um, we spoke with the, the chief medical officer and, and explained what we wished to do with the recovery trial and at that meeting which was just 30 minutes we got the green light to go ahead and get the trial up and running. And we managed to truncate it down just to nine days um, from getting that green light to enrolling the first patient. So we really, over the last decade, have gone from you know, no trials uh, to three and a half months to you know, a month to 20 days in Wuhan, now down to nine days. And as you'll see, um, that really makes a difference. Timing and scale are everything when it comes to epidemic infections. And I'll now um, hand over to Martin. Thank you very much. And um, if I have my next slide, please. So just building on from uh, uh, Peter's comments about the, the key principles about quick, big and definitive, I think there are, are some others that really matter. Uh, 
clearly we needed robust results and we needed them fast, but we also had to consider the well-being of the patients in the trial, many of whom uh, were very sick um, and all of whom were essentially alone. We also had to consider the well-being of the staff who were going to be uh, overloaded, both in terms of their time pressure and, their, and the amount of uh, work they were having to get through, but also emotionally. And in those circumstances, really, one has no choice but to focus only on what matters. And the traditions and, and habits of uh, regular clinical trials need really to be left behind. It was really essential to communicate and collaborate and transparency, being honest and open about everything that we're doing with the research community, the medical community, patients, public, the media, politicians, and so on, was also a key part of, of, of what, what mattered. Next slide, please. But we can look back to look forwards and, and uh, having been a cardiovascular trialist for the last 20 something years and only literally days into uh, thinking about infections at that time, it, I was reminded about the treatment trials for acute heart attack from the 1980s. Landmark, large, simple trials studying perhaps one or two drugs, um, uh, but with a very simple design, a, a one page case report form focused on outcomes that matter, death, um, and demonstrating very rapidly that treatments um, could have modest effects, but really important effects. And those effects could be additive. So if you could find one treatment worked and then two treatments that worked, you'd have incremental changes and improvements on survival. But that ISIS-2 International uh, Study of Infarct Survival Trial from the late 1980s, when I was at medical school, on the front page, it had a, a comment, a statement, by far the most important determinant of the success of this trial is the extent to which the responsible physicians and nurses choose to enter their patients. Hence the extra work must be, and it is absolutely minimal. And it was with that uh, that we set about writing the uh, protocol for recovery. And I quite literally had the uh, ISIS-2 protocol on the left-hand side of my desk as Peter and I were writing uh, the recovery protocol. Um, uh, uh, and, and working out what were the things that really mattered and how could we focus on those. Next slide, please. Well, as I say, simple eligibility criteria, we recognised that we knew relatively little about the disease, but the patients who were admitted to hospital were clearly the sickest. Mortality, unfortunately, for those patients at the time was something like one in four patients uh, would not get out of hospital alive, which is... is, is uh, you know, clearly a tragedy at a huge scale. We need to focus on that important outcome, but also, of course, the use of ventilators. At the time, we didn't know simply whether we'd have enough ventilators or enough staff to operate them. And then also the duration of the uh, hospital stay. Again, we were worried about how many hospital beds, how many nurses we'd have, and so we could didn't have an impact on that, it would matter. We used randomization. The, that is, I guess, the one magic bullet in the whole of recovery is the coin toss that assigns treatments uh, to patients uh, based on chance and allows fair comparisons. And then again, a one page case report form, a one page consent form focused on informing patients rather than simply uh, overloading with, with information um, that is uh, incomprehensible. And then uh, focus on a very simple design. Initially, anybody who's admitted to hospital uh, with suspected or confirmed COVID, and then the single coin, toin, uh, coin toss which meant that patients would get one of four active treatments or no additional treatment on top of usual care. And the outcomes, as I say, focused on mortality. Next slide, please. Over time, the trial became successful, as we'll go on to hear about. And that meant that we were add, able to add in complexity, um, uh, at least scientific complexity, as we, as we proceeded forwards. So that instead of a single coin toss, patients who go into the trial, for example, in January of this year, might actually, um, uh, there might actually be four different coin tosses, you know, perhaps culture scene versus uh, usual care, perhaps convalescent plasma or the monoclonal antibodies versus usual care, uh, treatments to prevent clotting versus usual care, and treatments targeted at particular parts of the immune pathway or usual care. And as a consequence, some patients, a few patients, could end up with four active treatments. Some will end up with no active treatments. The fundamental principle is we don't know who's going to be best off. We're doing the trial to find out and find out rapidly. Next slide. Now, one of the things about the NHS is that the NHS uh, collects huge amounts of information all the time 
on 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 patients. So I think it's it's true for all of us, certainly in the UK, and it must be about, uh, true uh, in many parts of the uh, the rest of the world too. But it's very difficult to see a doctor or a nurse without them tapping into a computer of some sort, whether it's to check your date of birth. Uh, record information like ethnicity or family history, or to record information about what treatments you, you, you're given uh, and behind the scenes uh, when you're discharged from hospital and, what, and for what reasons and so on and so forth. Now that information is all there, but even in the so-called one NHS, it's quite um, disparately collected. It's organised on a country by country basis, Scotland, Wales, England and Northern Ireland, and in multiple different data sets. And one of the key aspects of recovery as we've been able to bring together that data and use that to help us in the analyses. Why is that important? Well, it means that we get um, complete follow-up of everybody who goes into the trial. If patients move from one hospital to the next, because for example, that's where the ventilator is, we still know what happens to them. And it also means we don't have to ask questions twice. We don't have to uh, bother the patients by asking them for information that has already been recorded by their own doctors for their routine healthcare. We don't have to uh, uh, make uh, doctors and nurses who are busy enough as it is uh, record information for a second time. And we can use these routine data systems. Next slide. Now, recovery is truly embedded in the NHS. Uh, and this slide, um, which was is a snapshot from October, November last year, I could have really picked at any time over the course of the last year. But each line, each dot represents one hospital, one of 178 or so hospitals. And the uh, bars represent the number of patients admitted with COVID uh, to those hospitals during this particular time period. And the dots represent the proportion of all those patients admitted to that particular hospital who are uh, inc included in the trial. And what you can say is that you can see is that some hospitals were busier than others. They saw more patients, that's to be expected. Some patients, some hospitals um, were much more active and able to recruit a higher number of their patients into the trial than others and some of that's to be accept, expected and some of that uh, gives an idea of where there are opportunities for improvement and to learn from the best performing sites. But overall, roughly speaking, about one in ten patients who were admitted to hospital with COVID over the course of the last year have been enrolled in the recovery trial. Next slide, please. The COVID can affect anyone, so the trial's open to everyone regardless of age, from less than six months to over 100 years. Sex, uh, I think is around 30 or 40% are female. Uh, we have um, uh, 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 dozens of patients who are pregnant, uh, regardless of ethnicity, 18% of patients are from black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, backgrounds, comorbidity, other illnesses, or indeed geography, every single hospital in the country. And as a consequence, recruitment was fast, breathtakingly uh, uh, fast. And you can see in the first wave, if one looks back to uh, that peak on the left hand side is essentially a year ago, uh, then uh, we were seeing around 400 patients entered into the trial each day. Over the January uh, uh, session, uh, when we had our second or third wave, depending on how you count them, we were up to over 500 patients uh, entering into the trial each day. Because we kept it simple, because it was possible to do this, even in the most extreme circumstances for the NHS. Next slide, please. And consequently, we have been able to study a number of drugs. Um, I think we're on our 10th, 11th and 12th drugs at the moment um, in very, very large numbers. Essentially, name the, for each of these drugs, recovery is the largest trial of that drug in the world for, um, uh, of any kind. And yet we've managed to do that all within one trial all in one country uh, up until the recent um, uh, transition to uh, um, uh, the international component uh, and all in one year. Final slide. And I've mentioned transparency, everything that I've shown, everything that we do, we put onto the public website. Uh, this doesn't include individual patient data, of course, but it does include all the results, including every protocol, every ethics submission, every piece of training material, how the recruitment is going so that we're all in this and all in this together and all trying to solve the same problem together. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Raha West, um, who is one of the doctors working um, at the Buckinghamshire Healthcare Hospitals, uh, particularly in Aylesbury, um, who is going to share her experience of what it was like working on recovery 
um, at the front line. So thank you, Raha. Thank you, Richard. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm delighted to share my experience of running the recovery trial at my NHS Trust. I'm an anaesthetist and I work in intensive care at a district general hospital in Buckinghamshire. Next slide, please. Throughout the pandemic, especially in the beginning, it has been quite stressful and at times frightening being on the front line. We had to stretch our capacity beyond imagination. When I first looked into recovery trial, at the time with so many uncertainties about the best treatment for COVID patient, I thought this trial was crucial. But I also thought this could be a huge undertaking because everywhere you look, it was so busy and we had a small team to start with. It was just me and research nurse. I remember telling her, it's okay. There's no minimum target to recruit. There's no pressure, we can do this. But partly I was convincing myself but as we progress, the trial was the one thing that I had to hold on to. It brought me hope and positivity during the trying times. Next slide, please. Um, after reading the clear and concise protocol and watch a few short training videos, we were good to go. We put posters everywhere, even in the, in the staff toilets to raise awareness. We implemented the trial at our hospital in record times. Um, we found it very straightforward. The amount of paperwork required has been stripped right down to essential. And this made it easier to promote the trial amongst the very busy clinicians. We can do all this as part of our day-to-day -day clinical care. And we found that our patients and relatives has been very receptive of the trial. I think the pragmatic nature of the trial is the unique feature when uh, delivering the trial. Next slide, please. With the number of COVID cases rising, I realized early on that I needed to build a solid team under a well-informed leadership. So I talked to as many people as I can at the hospital and to make it even easier for our staff, we produce a quick guide, as you can see there, where staff can just um, go to refer to. I also felt it was important for me to make uh, everyone in my team feel appreciated while keeping them confident with my support. As the lead, being present and engaging was vital, so I, I made myself available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because I feel the staff and clinicians need to feel comfortable with the various arms of the trial and know that the safety of the trial participant is well looked after. To boost morale and competitive streak amongst my recruiting team, I reward them with certificates. We had recruiter of the week and significant contribution certificate because everyone loves certificate and it motivates the team. The ward staff has been helpful and very involved. And as a thank you, a few boxes of chocolate biscuit at Christmas or out of the blue did go a long way. Find a slide, please. On a personal level, I have learned a lot and I feel privileged to have the experience of delivering this trial. I had the opportunity to do more for my patients. I was able to engage a lot of staff and clinicians about research. And I found uh, I was able to involve many trainees and medical students, and they had opportunity to learn about research, which they might not have otherwise. And most of them has really enjoyed their experience, and so have I. Recovery trial was built into our routine clinical care, and I think this is the key that made recovery trial extremely successful and should be the benchmark for future trials. Recovery trial helped me and my patients during the darkest time, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raha. Uh, that was great to hear. And thank you to you and, and your team working so hard in, in Buckinghamshire and for all the teams uh, in the UK and in the hospitals around the world um, delivering this trial on the ground. So now I'm really delighted to introduce Kimberly Featherston, who um, was on the other end of the trial, if you like. So Kimberly uh, developed COVID and she's now going to tell us a bit about her story um, and and how the recovery trial fitted into that. So thank you very much, Kimberly. Thank you, Richard. Um, so first I was asked, oh, could I have my next slide, please? My only slide. <laughs> thank you. 
Um, I was asked to tell a little about my experience with COVID before we got to the uh, time of the trial. Um, so throughout having, being a teaching assistant, so being in school, even over lockdown and going into school and working with kids, I'd always sort of thought, well, it's not a case of if I'm going to get COVID, it's more like a matter of when I'm going to get COVID. So uh, even though I'd had that idea in my head, um, when I started to feel, oh, well, I feel a bit strange. Oh, I can't quite taste my coffee properly. I was like, no, it'll just be something else. I'll, I'll do a test just in case. And so when it came back positive, I was still in denial a little like, well, no, like, it can't be that bad. It'll be fine. Um, because at that point, I didn't personally know anybody that had had it. So it still seemed like something that's happening somewhere else. Um, but soon as the days went on, I uh, got quite short of breath going from downstairs and then I would get short of breath walking from one end of the kitchen to the other, um, developing other symptoms and uh, just collecting them as I went along. Um, I did go to the hospital uh, to A&E at one point on day five, I believe it was, uh, when my, I couldn't get my breathing back under control. But my sats were all great, so they sent me home with some um, steroids, uh, oral steroids, and, and an inhaler, sorry, not antibiotics. Um, a couple of days after that, I picked up a bit, and I was like, okay, great, I've turned the, turned the corner now, it's all going to be great. And uh, But then sort of day seven and eight, started going downhill again, and then day nine, I just sat up in bed and felt like my lungs were about <laughs> this, this big. I could just take in tiny little hiccups of air. And it was quite scary and unpleasant, and thought, oh, of course. <laughs> so I um, still made my partner ring 111 before going to the hospital for some reason and uh, went to AE and got put on oxygen. He said, Congratulations, you get to stay. Uh, and uh, all three, I was still um, felt more or less okay myself. Um, so it was a bit strange because I didn't feel the whole fluiness of wanting to just be not doing nothing, um, which I've kind of expected. Uh, so that was day nine when I got admitted and uh, yeah, put on oxygen um, just uh, and started having anti antibiotics, antivirals um, and dexamethasone, good old dexamethasone. Um, so um, I'd been in the hospital a couple of days when a doctor came to visit me and the way she said it was a sheepish approach because the way she came up to me, it's sort of, I got the impression she was used to being rejected. Um, she was like, oh, I'd, I'd just like to speak to you about this. You don't have to do it, um, but, you know, I'll speak to you about it. I said, oh, is it the trial? I've, I've heard something about the trial. Um, and she goes, yes, it is. I said, oh, great, sign me up. Like, oh, do you want to um, know more about it? No, no, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just, I'll do it. Um, and uh, she kept saying, um, well, do you have any questions? Do you, are you worried about anything? No, no, just, I'll do it. I'm, it's great. I would love to do it. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I'm quite scientifically minded. Um, I do teach a bit of science and um, so, and I, you know, it's, I know that trials have to happen, so I was really up for it. Um, I was given the um, piece of paper showing in the, in the picture there. And um, I took a picture of it, sent it to anybody I thought who might be interested, saying, this is great, look what I'm doing, look what the hospital's doing, because, um, for this trial, this huge national trial to be happening in, you know, my little local hospital seemed like a big deal. And obviously now I know that every hospital in the country has been involved, which is wonderful. Um, so she then came back and told me that I'd been assigned to the monoclonal antibodies group, um, which was the ones I wanted. So I was happy. I don't know why I wanted them. I'd have been disappointed if I'd been put in the control group. Um, so yeah, I was sort of waiting around for them, um, really excited to try it and kept every time someone came up to the towards my uh, bed, I'd be like, oh, have they come yet? Have they come yet? It was like Christmas. Um, finally got them on Monday evening. It'd been a Sunday when the doctor came to speak to me. So obviously um, things don't happen that much on Sundays um, in hospitals. And so the antibodies came up, I got hooked up to it. Um, said you know just stay there as you do <laughs> and uh, and then it went and bizarrely about half an hour after I started having the monoclonal antibodies in my right arm um, the left side of my body um, turned red like I'd been sat in the sun um, my right ear so my left ear was red hot my face was red all this round I don't have any allergies I've never reacted to anything in my life 
Um, and I didn't feel I was having an allergic reaction. It just, and I only pointed it out to the doctors because with it being research, I thought it was probably something they would want to know. I was like, I'm not worried, I'm not bothered, just letting you know this has happened. And this lovely guy came over and asked me millions of questions, kept touching me in various places. It was quite, uh, it was a bit personal. Um, and um, they just couldn't apologize enough. And um, so someone from the research team came over and, oh, we're so sorry. Oh, we'll give you some antihistamine. But it was like, I'm really, really sorry this happened. Like, no, no, I'm not worried at all. I'm not bothered at all. I just thought you probably needed to know for your for your purposes. Um, so they were, they couldn't have been nicer. They couldn't have been more caring. And uh, it was all, all over a pleasant experience, even if I did have this peculiar reaction to it. Um, then I thought I'd say something about why I wanted to take part in the trial because I'd spent quite a lot of time over the last year feeling like that I should be doing something or I wish I could do something more useful than staying home. <laughs> and I know at that point, staying home as a member of the public is probably the most important thing I could do, but I really wanted to do something more. Um, not that I went out of my way to, to get COVID to, uh, to do that, but um, I often felt that I wished I could do more. Um, and having a sort of scientific background knowledge, I know that research is the only reason why things happen and why things change and that we wouldn't be here today if we didn't have um, the benefit of all the medical research that's happened for hundreds of years. Um, I have an inherent trust in science um, and the NHS. I would never for a minute think that they were going to do something that would harm me. So that's another reason I didn't have any concerns. And overall, just a massive feeling of gratitude for all the work that's been done in the last year and for all the lives that have been saved and people who haven't got as sick as they may well have done. And, uh, and that is my bit. And I would just like to say thank you so much to everybody involved because it really is incredible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kimberly. That was great. Um, Please, if you have got any questions for Kimberly or any of the other speakers, please do put them into the Q&A on Zoom or put them into the uh, comment box if you're watching on YouTube. Um, but now I'd like to introduce uh, Natalie Saplin, um, one of the statisticians who's been working on the trial, who's going to give us an overview of the results of the trial to date. So thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Richard. Could I have the next slide, please? So there's been lots of treatments tested so far in recovery, and there's been two successes, as you can see in the uh, centre of this slide, indicated by the green circle. So last summer, relatively early on in the pandemic, it was found that a steroid called dexamethasone uh, reduced death in the sickest patients. So in patients who are on a ventilator, deaths were reduced by about a third, and you also got a fifth reduction in patients who were receiving oxygen but not yet on a ventilator. More recently, in patients with severe COVID, we've um, announced that toxalizumab also reduces deaths by about 15%. And this is including in people who are already on dexamethasone, which was great news. So that means you can combine the two treatments to get um, even larger benefits. So in patients who are on a ventilator, you could reduce deaths by nearly a half by giving both of these treatments and reduce deaths by a third in people who are on oxygen but not a ventilator. Uh, there have been some, also been some treatments have been shown not to be effective and these are shown on the left hand side of the screen with the red circles. So for hydroxychloroquine, lipinavir, ritonavir, azithromycin and convalescent plasma, there's no evidence that the number of deaths is reduced in participants compared to uh, patients who have been treated with the usual standard of care. And the trial is still ongoing for several um, other treatments. And these are, you can see on the right hand side of the screen with yellow orange circles. So coltracine is now closed to recruitment and um, has, it has now been announced that that is not effective and the results for that are being written up. Aspirin has closed uh, to recruitment and follow-up is ongoing. The results of that are expected around late April, early May. And then for participants who are currently being recruited into the trial, they could be randomised to um, three treatments, those being Regeneron's antibody cocktail, baricitinib or dimethyl fumarate.
Thanks very much, uh, Natalie. So um, in our final talk, before we get to the q and I'm delighted to welcome Raf Hamers and Ernie Nelwyn uh, from Indonesia um, to explain to us a bit about recovery and what it's like taking it um, internationally. So thanks very much, Raf. Thank you very much, Richard, uh, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to speak to you about uh, the experience in Indonesia and uh, taking part in the international branch of recovery. Um, when Peter Horby uh, reached out to us, we were thrilled and excited to be able to contribute to this very important trial and also to be able to uh, include this part of the world uh, in this effort. And at the same time, also um, learn lessons that, um, um, that have uh, let reach beyond the UK and the Western world alone. So I think that was uh, an amazing opportunity for us. Um, so the international branch of recovery is now um, expanded to include Vietnam, Nepal and Indonesia and is also currently working on uh, including African countries as well. I will be delivering this talk together with Dr. Ernie Nelwan, who is an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Indonesia, and she will be taking over from me after my first uh, remarks. Next slide, please. So Indonesia, for people who are not so familiar with the country, is a, a big nation in uh, Southeast Asia. It actually has the fourth largest population globally, 270 million. Um, the epidemic has hit hard in this country. Uh, it has the second highest number of COVID cases and that's in Asia behind India, India. And the epidemic is still ongoing, as you can see in the graphs on the right hand side. Um, it has had a huge impact on the health system with uh, um, uh, hospitals being overburdened for uh, periods of times in, in different stages of uh, the epidemic. Fortunately, a vaccine rollout has started in January this year. But um, as you can imagine, uh, there are still huge challenges ahead to reach the large uh, geographically spread population. So the epidemic is definitely not over yet. Next slide. So the Oxford University has long-standing research partnerships in Asia, uh, but particularly also in Indonesia, uh, as part of the Wellcome Trust supported Africa Asia program, as you can see in the colorful uh, comic or cartoon on the uh, right hand side. You can see that the Oxford University has a center for tropical medicine and global health and has overseas laboratories connected to that in Africa and Asia and Indonesia is part of that network. So. In Indonesia, we partner with uh, our host institutions, and they are premier research institutions in this country, uh, University of Indonesia, particularly their Faculty of Medicine, and the Aikman Institute for Molecular Biology. And we share a vision of striving for excellence in biomedical research of infectious diseases that is important for the country and the region. Most of what we do is clinical trials on uh, malaria, tuberculosis, and now COVID. Next trial, please. Next slide, please. So, that situation put us in a very good position to connect with our friends and our host and um, really move very fast in establishing this trial in the country. So it facilitated site selection, the setup and the governance. Um, so how we work is that uh, the Oxford unit in Jakarta provides support to the clinical sites and we have selected sites and we created that in, in a network across the country in major urban cities. And each hospital is then uh, being led by a site Principal investigator. I will now hand over to my colleague Annie, who will give you some more insight on uh, implementation and challenges. Thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, my name is Annie Nelwan. I'm the IB physician in the uh, University of Indonesia, Cipto Mangun Kusumo Hospital. So, for the implementation uh, for recovery trial, we uh, luckily can involve several sites not only in the capital Jakarta but also another sites in in different islands as you can see that we are conscious of uh, five big islands so there's one in Sumatra uh, Mayan, one in the uh, West Java East Java uh, Celebs and also in, uh, uh, in Bali and Pasar uh, it is uh, well uh, regarding the, the trial itself. At this moment, there's a support for the for the government. So as you can see here, uh, we can uh, manage to have the approval of ethical committee for only a week. But then since the trial is uh, changing due to the to the, 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 the adaptive trial uh, 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 mechanism, so we need every time of course, to them uh, do the amendment, and it is it takes some time to do that. But 
somehow we manage at this moment with two sites, one in the capital and in the uh, and the other one is in uh, Medan. We have our regional trial steering committee, and we aim to include uh, 2,000 uh, participants in two years. And um, at this moment, uh, for only one month, we able to recruit uh, to the 80 patients. Slides, please. So this is the things that uh, you know that might be different in in UK settings because everything is under one control, the NHS, that makes uh, everything uh, seems easier. So, but then we have to be able to for for Indonesia in particular uh, explain to the to the authority uh, how they can understand the protocol uh, easily and then. We have to select uh, the site. We have to know uh, who we work with, the, the team in particular, also the, the support and backup. And, and uh, about this, I, I should mention that the, 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 the backup support from the uh, eight-month Oxford uh, from Dr. Raf's teams is uh, extremely uh, needed and important. And we also have to be communicate all the time with the, with the authority to have uh, the, 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 the easier or smoother process. But still, of course, uh, we have to uh, be patient with, the, uh, with the, the pills, the drugs, the pharmacy stock, because some of it's not uh, available in, 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 in Indonesia. And then in each hospital, you have to sit and, and, and discuss about the agreement. And also now, since uh, some of the uh, next uh, uh, trial will uh, be using uh, medicine that might be, you know, intervene with the uh, background epidemiology uh, disease like TB and hepatitis B co-infection. So then uh, we have to also see the local uh, standards of treatment uh, to be safe uh, deliver all the new trial arms. Thanks very much, Ernie and Raf. Um, that's that was great. So um, we, we're going to go into the Q and A session now. So if you have got any questions, please put them into the box. Um, there is a second poll. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you go back to the chat um, on Zoom or follow the link again on YouTube, you'll be able to find another poll which would be interested to see your your answers in. Um, but we'll we'll go to um, Q and A. So if I could ask all of the uh, speakers to um, put their microphones and cameras on, that would be great. I'll give the first question to Peter, if that's all right. Um, quite a few questions about how how did we actually decide which treatments we wanted to test in recovery? What was the we tested ten or twelve treatments, which sounds like a lot, but there are probably hundreds of candidates. How did we narrow it all down? Yeah, I mean it's it's ten or twelve separate trials, which is great, but there, there's a huge number of potential treatments that have been put forward and certainly uh, my inbox and I know many others has been full with suggestions of, of things to test. Um, so there's a process that we've gone through looking at various criteria. Uh, uh, the first obviously is what's the evidence of the likely effectiveness and safety of the drug. Um, we've also then looked at what population group may benefit most from that kind of intervention because there are other trials you know in, in in prevention, in outpatients who have mild illness or in hospitalised patients like we have or in just in intensive care. And then we look at the whether the drugs are suitable um, for the trial in terms of the number of doses that are available because we're aiming for large definitive uh, results which requires many thousands of patients to be treated and whether we can deliver the drug <clears throat> within the, the design of the trial uh, in a way that's safe um, and then also whether if we show that the drug works, it's likely to be something that could be scalable uh, internationally. And so currently, we, initially we did that ourselves, but there's now an in independent committee that looks at the data called the uh, COVID Therapeutics Advisory Panel, and they, they review all the data and they make recommendations to us um, as to whether the drugs come into our trial or into other trials, because there are other trials. Now we've not been able to evaluate um, all of the drugs, but um, we're trying to get through as many as we can and those that are most promising. 
Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, Raha, could I ask um, the next question to you, um, which we've had, which is, um, how did you as a, as a hospital come to hear about the trial? Um, and how do you think we communicate about these trials around the country to make sure that we get all the hospitals in participating as quickly as we can? Well, I think um, the role of a clinical research network, uh, the clinical research network play a major role in, in, in promoting and helping to deliver recovery trial. I certainly hear it from the research department and the CRN about a trial. Um, it's 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 you know it's very easy to 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 look into the trial and um, there's a website that everybody can uh, go into which cater for patients and staff and it's very very informative uh, so it's the information is out there but um, the the role of clinical research network was very important I think um, in delivering and promoting the trial. Okay. Thanks very much, Raha. We've got lots of questions, so I have to apologise to people if you've you've asked a question um, and we don't get to answer it. Um, but we'll get through as many as we can, uh, bearing in mind um, we need to finish this uh, by 10 o'clock. Um, so the next question for, for Natalie. Um, you said that we found two drugs that work, um, dexamethasone and tocilizumab. And presumably th these are now going to be given to most of the future participants. How does that affect the um, the other drugs that we're still testing in the trial? And um, so, well, because we're randomising, um, as long as um, so, when these uh, drugs get added to the usual standard of care, because we're randomising people between what is their current standard of care and the treatment, it means that we can test whether the treatments um, in the trial um, are working on top of what these these um, drugs. So. Yeah, it allows us to to see whether drugs work, given that you're already giving things we know work. Thanks, Natalie. Um, Martin, this is a question I expect will be um, close to your heart. Um, do you think that the the standard practice or common practice, say, of using uh, drugs outside of a trial out of desperation is justified or should trials be really be the uh, sort of standard care, essentially? Well, I think there's two sides to that. I mean, clearly there are many parts of the world um, where there isn't the option of a trial. There simply isn't a trial. Now, in the UK, we made recovery available everywhere, uh, and at least in every hospital. But I do think it is challenging to give to patients a treatment which you just do not know whether it works or not. And you're making, a, in a sense, an unjustified and unfounded uh, promise um, uh, of hope to that patient in the absence of any knowledge about whether you're actually doing them, like whether you're actually helping them, harming them or neither. And also remember that these treatments that might be being given uh, on uh, a sort of arbitrary basis, uh, that takes resource. It takes manufacturing, it takes the cost of the drugs, it takes the time of the nurses and the doctors in the hospitals making up those drugs, administering those medicines. And uh, remember that that arbitrary process actually means that some patients get these treatments and some don't get them. And actually we never learn about how we should treat the next patient or the next patients um, as, we, as the pandemic un, uh, un, unrolls. So I really do think that when as doctors, when there's healthcare professionals, when we don't know what we're doing and in with a new disease like COVID, of course, we don't know what we're doing. Um, that's understandable, that's an honest appraisal of the situation, then randomising is uh, randomising in large numbers to get a quick and, and clean answer about which treatments are effective and which ones are not is the right way to go. And if we look across the course of the last year, patients in the second wave in the UK were, were treat, given better care because of the, the results we got from the first wave. They were given dexamethasone, they were not given hydroxychloroquine, because of the results from the first wave. Patients in the second and third wave here are now being again treated better than they were in earlier waves. And if there were a future wave in the UK, that will also continue to be true. And that is true also internationally. This, the nature of a pandemic, it says it in the, in the word, is that it's a global problem. And so just as uh, pan the, the, the tide of the pandemic may seem to be going out in one part of the world, it's coming in somewhere else. And so the knowledge you gain from one part of the world becomes incredibly important in other parts of the world. 
So I think it is absolutely the case that when we don't know what we're doing, um, and we don't, and there are good reasons for that, and there's lots of reasons for believing particular drugs are very likely to work or very not very unlikely to work, we have to do randomization. And if I look back on the results of recovery, I think for every drug that we have got a result, it has gone against a large swathe of popular and apparently well-informed medical opinion. We've had people tell us we shouldn't randomize patients to dexamethasone because suppressing the immune system would be dangerous. We've had uh, comments, you, should, you must be giving everybody hydroxychloroquine because it obviously works. You know, those are well, many of them are well-reasoned, well-argued uh, positions. But the bottom line is, if we don't know what we're doing, then we better find out and we better find out fast. And the randomized trials are the way to do that. You can't do that unless one, there's a randomized trial. And secondly, uh, that it's actually practical. There's no good saying to a frontline doctor like Raha, you can't prescribe anything. You've got to do this trial. But by the way, this trial is going to take you hours and hours per patient in order to do it. It's going to be infeasible. You've got to, you've got to strip this down to the things that really matter. And that's the way we improve the, uh, the, uh, the outcomes for patients um, wherever they are the world, in the world affected by COVID. And indeed, the same rationale applies to many other conditions. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Kimberly, there's a question for you, if that's all right. Um, members, of, members of the audience would like to know how you're feeling now. Um, and I'd like <laughs> to know good. if you ever look back <laughs> on what you did in recovery and had it, ever had second thoughts. Um, certainly never had second thoughts. Um, I, uh, how I feel now, um, I do have, I've long, got long COVID, uh, which is great. Um, and uh, I do still have some issues. Um, but I don't think that's related in, in any way to recovery. As many, well, the majority of people who go on to develop long COVID never actually were hospitalised. So I, I don't know if there's an implication that that might have been um, been related. But uh, yeah, I'm still having issues, but I'm certainly a million miles better than I was when I was acutely unwell with COVID. That's Great. Opinion. Very pleased to hear it. Um, OK, we're just coming to the end. So if you if you've got a, a question that you're very keen to ask, please do get it into the chat um, as quickly as you can. Um, Raf, maybe a, a question for you. Um, do you think that trials like recovery could change the way that we do trials in the future? Um, maybe in Indon specifically in Indonesia, do you think the, the simple procedures could set a, a new template for how other trials could run? Well, yeah, I think it's a great question, and I truly hope so, because I think what, what you see in our setting is that um, uh, trials like this are often slowed down by bureaucracy. People, uh, many committees, many authorities needing to take decisions, which slows down the process. And I think um, what, we, what we are now showing that we can do this trial within current regulations, but, but pushing the limit and, and being in, you know, closely engaging with the authorities, that this is also a way of doing a trial, very simple, um, very dynamic, um, uh, like an adaptive design, I think that is also pretty new to uh, to our ethics committee and uh, regulatory authority. So I think in doing so, I think we can also uh, build capacity in those institutions, in those um, uh, it's, um, committees, so that they in the future can also accommodate those those types of trials. So I think it actually is very helpful for uh, for taking on these trials in this setting. Yeah, it's, it's a very great experience for everybody involved. Thanks very much, Ra. Um, I think we're we're very near the end of time now, so I'm just going to ask um, maybe to Peter and Martin. <clears throat> there's there's a, a question um, in the Q and A. Um, whoever wants to answer first can take the easy one. The, the other person will be left with the hard one. Um, what do you want to do the same again next time, um, and what would you do differently? Um, I'll I'll start because I've got a slightly different answer to Martin. I know. I mean, I think that. The, the, the issue for me is how can we export the design? You know, m most of the, the, the threatening infections um, you know, may occur in lower income settings where we don't have the infrastructure. And for me, I really want to learn is, is, is what elements of this can we take and, and export so that we can use it in diseases like Lassa fever in West Africa or Nipah virus in Bangladesh and places like that where we will struggle with you know, some of the issues that, that would be much easier within the NHS. Um, I don't think I would have done much differently, to, to be honest. I mean, I think there's little tweaks we can do to improve um, how things were done in the UK. And I think the big lesson is that we should keep these platforms open. 
because we have ongoing respiratory infections like you know respiratory syncytial virus influenza um, we should keep these platforms open and try and improve care for those common common garden diseases and then we'll also have the platform ready for if anything like this unexpectedly hits us again. Thanks Martin. Well I think given how little we knew at the time and the speed at which we set up um, um, in a sense good fortune was on our side I think we we there's not a whole load that I would change about the way that we did this, this particular trial in the UK. Um, if you want something technical, I would say that um, I would have moved to the sort of factorial design much earlier on. In fact, I might even have started there because that allows us to study multiple treatments simultaneously, as well as the interactions between those treatments. Um, but I'm with Peter. I think that the question is how does what going forward is how does one um, uh, use this sort of platform. One thing is that the virus moves around the planet pretty pretty fast. Moving a trial around the planet moves uh, remarkably slowly by comparison and I think we have to internationally we have to fix that so that the trial can move as rapidly as the virus does. But you know I said earlier on my own area is largely in cardiovascular and chronic diseases so not in the respiratory infections that Peter's talked about and there's so much about this platform that we could use uh, to understand even quite simple questions um, uh, uh, in the, the treatment and management of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, osteoporosis, uh, uh, chronic lung diseases, mental health, and many other areas. I think getting randomization and randomized trials as part of a routine part of clinical care is the way in which we can drive improvements in so many other conditions. I think that's the way forward. Okay. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, uh, we've just put a slide up now. There's a huge number of people to thank um, for an event like today. First of all, I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, for all of their time and their, their excellent talks. Um, I'd also, for a trial, there's, there's too many people to thank, but we have to thank the people who fund it, all the um, agencies that have supported us. I'd like to give a special thanks to members of the team in Oxford who really worked tirelessly over the last year to deliver this to all of the sites, uh, Raha and all her colleagues around the UK and around the world who've delivered this trial. Uh, but I think our biggest thanks has to be uh, to all of our really brave participants who, like Kimberly, at a terrifying time in their lives, um, were brave enough um, to say yes to that invitation um, and contribute um, such invaluable information. So our biggest thanks really goes uh, to them. Uh, just as we wrap up, there is a poll um, another poll, if you're willing to uh, just give us your opinion. Um, and at this time, there's an opportunity just to give three words, up to three words that you associate uh, with the recovery trial. So uh, the link is in the usual place. Um, and this webinar has been recorded um, and um, will be available at the address there. You can see on the screen that will also be in the chat on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, you will be able to be viewed uh, in the future, uh, should you wish to watch it again or uh, get any of your friends, families or colleagues to watch it. But thank you very much indeed uh, for your time this morning. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it educational um, and thank you very much. Goodbye.